Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea Tour is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, David Hayes, and Polar Inertia Journal, an outlet for artists and researchers documenting the urban condition at polarinertia.com. We're sitting here in Cheongwon, South Korea, and it's a city that, unless somebody's pretty familiar with Korea, they might not have heard of. But it's a cool town. Why is it cool? Uh, well, Cheongwon is the uh, environmental capital of South Korea, and it is a kind of flagship city for the environmental programs that uh, Korea wants to push forward for the 21st century. It's a planned city. Uh, it's made famous by its public bike share system, uh, Nubija, uh, which started in 2008, which for public bike share systems is, is rather old in the game at this point. Um, and the way that the public bike share system works is it's uh, funded and highly subsidized and owned by the city of Changwon. And it's really been designed as a form of public transportation that is a bike share system, and it, and it is used as such. Um, other things that make Changwon a great place is uh, other cities in Korea haven't necessarily prioritized the use of public space, green space, parks, uh, cycle lanes, uh, cy cy uh, separated cycle tracks, um, and Changwon has kind of prided itself in uh, leading forward and progressing with uh, these environmental issues and spaces. And it's here in that environmental capital I'm coming to you today on Notebook on Cities and Culture. And in fact, to get to the recording point today, I rode one of those Nubija bikes, and I've been having a good time on them. I came here before, just a, a week or two ago, rode around, and I'm back here today to talk to Kobe Zeisman, who in his time living here in Cheongwon has worked with the Nubija bike system and has, has done some volunteering, has done some outreach, I can call you the outreach coordinator, yes? You've been that? Yes. Yes. Which involves what for the spike system? I mean, it's a, it's a cool system, but what outreach has it needed? Okay. So uh, the outreach that I have been able to do is doing outreach toward uh, creating familiarity with Nubija within the international community. Uh, that would include uh, social networking, uh, Twitter, Instagram, making uh, Nubija better known to the uh, world community. Uh, I'm, uh, so before before coming here, there wasn't much uh, knowledge. The outside community didn't really know much about Changwon, didn't know much about Nubija. So I mean, and the rest of the world didn't yes, know about yes, it. Yes, yes. Um, so things like there's a website, but the website doesn't have information in English. So these kinds of things that wouldn't necessarily be... Uh, obvious to someone living in Korea, uh, think, oh, we should make this accessible to people outside. We should have it in English. These are kind of, unfortunately, can be kind of um, afterthoughts. And so I, I've kind of taken it upon myself and, and had to be within my duties to uh, share Changwon and share Nubija and what, what it is we do with the outside uh, uh, community. So with Koreans in Korea, in other cities, do they associate the name Changwon with a cool bike system? Like that's the city with the cool bike system, and maybe some of them have used it or known about it. Is it is it well known within Korea? I guess it is. It, it is. Um, you do you do have people that that will think like, oh yes, I've heard of that. Um, I mean, I think when you it depends the circles in which you're talking with people. I think even in places like the United States. Maybe some people will say, like, oh, yeah, I think I've heard of city bikes. Or, like, oh, yeah, I think I've heard Washington has a capital bike share system. So, but, the, I mean, the ones that are interested in environmental issues, they know about Changwon from its, uh, from its Nubija bike share system. And every chance it gets, Changwon is promoting its Nubija, Nubija, Nubija bike share system uh, to uh, the Korean community. Uh, for example, uh, in Ulsan, they have the Lantern Festival, where they have different organizations in different cities kind of present their their lantern and when I went there in 2012 it was a Nubija lantern so it was you know hey you know hey Ulsan this is we're, we're Changwon and this is our bike system this is what we are about but um, an interesting thing is what people would most associate with Changwon uh, people uh, in other places in Korea would say oh that's a 
um, that's kind of a industrial town. Uh, and a big part of the reason is uh, there's so much manufacturing in Changwon. Uh, basically, if you have an LG cell phone, I'm holding an LG cell phone right now, it probably came from the factory floor here in Changwon. It's the town LG built, essentially. Yeah. Yes, yes, much like Suwon is uh, the town that, that Samsung built. Um, but there's many, many things in uh, factories in Changwon. Uh, you know, they make cell phones, they make electronics, they make cars, they make weapons. There's lots of uh, industry here, and it's because of that industry that Changwon has been able to. Uh, have such a successful economy, and it's also because of this industry that the mayor uh, Park Won Su uh, decided, you know, we need to move forward and make Changwon a livable city, and we need these parks, and we need this bike share system, we need to offset the pollution and car traffic, and uh, it's kind of because of that, it's that Nubija and these uh, policies have emerged as 21st century solutions to a, this growing economy. There's, there are signs and there are logos on the side of like garbage cans here that say Changwon, young city. And it really is. It opened in what, 1980? Like the city opened. Not, the city's not that much older than us. Yeah, so the city is, is a planned city. It was planned after the city of Canberra in Australia. It was designated by the uh, provincial government of this will be, uh, you know, this city will be centered around uh, manufacturing, and this is this will be a planned city. Um, so, if you actually look at a map of Changwon, there is really just a, a distinct line, like everything south of the streets, what we call Changwon Dero. Dero is uh, day is big, row is street, so Changwon Big Street, the big street. A very literal name sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so everything south of Changwon Dero is just all manufacturing. It's, it's like this is where the manufacturing is, and then uh, everything north of Changwon Dero is this is where resident, this is residential, and this is commercial space. Um, and yeah, it is it is a new city. Uh, it, it opened like you said, like I mentioned earlier, in 1980. But there are surrounding communities here that have a little more history. Some the communities like Masan. And uh, Jinhe have been around much longer and have a longer history. Actually, Masan is home, I think, to uh, South Korea's oldest operating fish market or uh, something like that. Either either the oldest operating, oldest and still in operation or something like that. But it has a long history, yeah, whereas, long. whereas Changwon does not. Yes, yes. And actually, um, in 2010, the neighboring cities of Masan uh, and Jinhe became incorporated in Changwon. So Changwon was the newest, but it achieved so much uh, financial capital that it was able to incorporate Masan and Jinhe into its into its uh, city space. So now Masan and Jinhe are technically Changwon, and it increased Changwon's uh, population to 1.1 million and also increased the tax revenue that it's able to pull in. And when they did that, then Nubija came to those places, right? As the city expanded, so did Nubija. Yes, it did. So, and it's continuing to expand. So, uh, as part of Nubija's five-year development plan, uh, started in 2008, and then when those other cities of Jinhe and Masan became incorporated, um, the most expansion has occurred in Masan and in Jinhe. But as as mentioned earlier, you know, because Changwon was a planned city. Uh, it was planned to be very cycle friendly. So you have what would be the separated bike lanes, whether you have a curb or a barrier separating car traffic from bike traffic, making uh, uh, bike making biking uh, very safe and accessible for all riding. All riding in 1980, they thought of that. They thought of bike infrastructure. They, well, they had wider roads. Yeah. They they anticipated for the wider roads, and then they modified it. Um, so they had more space to work with, they easier more, space to work yes. with. Yes. Um, but so when Nubija has, has, as Nubija moved in the communities of Jinhe and Masan, they haven't had that space to work with because they've already had the communities there. They've got the narrower winding streets and the sort of, you know, the older Korean urbanism. Yes, yes, and so you don't have those uh, cushy separated bike lanes. But what is good ab about the sort of local government and how they've approached really this commitment to environmentalism in the communities is you do have projects expanding. So there's a rails to trails uh, uh, project in Masan in which they took an underused or unused railroad and they, had, they have it completely converted into a walking and cycle path. 
so, uh, you know, the government has been able to, what, what they can work with, they've been able to work with. How much did you know about Changwon before you came here? And you've been living here a fair few years, you're about to leave. So take, take us back to the opposite moment before you were about to come. What did you know? I knew that I had two friends here. And it's more than a lot of Americans who come to Korea. <laughs> so that's it. I knew, I knew that I had two friends here. They said there was hiking, which I like. And they had a public bike share system. And at this point, in, when I came here, so I've been here two years. When I came here in 2000, two, 2012 in July, uh, I didn't really know anything about what a public bike share system was. I'd kind of heard of it. And I thought, oh, that could be all right. I was already a cyclist, though, and I was intent on buying a, uh, my own bicycle. You're like, That's uh, neat, but I'll have my own, so right, whatever. Right. And then, uh, yeah, and then coming here, I, I, I seem to have learned maybe a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Now, when you got here, those first few weeks, months of living here, we, we talk about the livability of Changwon. Did, how livable did you find it immediately? Uh, I mean, it's it's an extremely livable and convenient place to be. Um, so, so when I did get my, so I, I like I said, I, I I bought a I bought a bike when I came here initially because I even 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 just a few weeks without for me not having a bike, it was kind of cramping my style. Like oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it, I was used to a, a kind of cycling lifestyle, and when I didn't have that, I was like, well, I need I need a bike. But the freedom of it, you get used to. Right, right. And then, uh, so there's a process. You have to wait to get your Nubija. To become eligible for a Nubija, you need your alien card. You must, you have to have a cell phone to get a, a Nubija pass. It's not run, payment's not run through a, uh, a credit card. It's through your cell phone. Uh, what, it, what it does is when you register with your cell phone, um, if there's any uh, fees or the bike gets lost or damaged, your phone company will be billed and then you uh, pay through your phone company um, which is not a convenient system for foreigners uh, I mean if I was just if I was just visiting Changwon and I didn't know you I wouldn't be able to use Nubija yes so you you must have a Korean cell phone and you must have a cell phone registered within your name so if you have say a lot of times people uh, foreigners will have uh, a hagwon or a school that the school bought them their cell phone but if it's not registered in their name, they can't get the Nubija pass. But once you do get your Nubija pass, it's uh, awesome. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, so I got my pass. Uh, it was twenty thousand won, which is about at that time was about eighteen U.S. dollars. Um, and from there, it's it's a year's pass. You have you can check out the bike for two hours at a time. Um, and there are at that time there were. 241 uh, stations all across Changwon, Masan area, Changwon, Masan, Jinhe area. So it's, it's very convenient. And when talking about livability, um, I mean, the reason that Changwon, I mean, the reason that Nubija was so appealing to get um, and to use, because I, I, I have a bike now, but I rarely use it uh, because I, I want to keep my bike in good condition. And also because I don't really feel like I need to. It's not a hindrance to use the Nubija at all. Pretty much anything I would want to, any place I would want to go or anything I would want to do, I can take a Nubija there. So I'm going to the movies, if I need to go do some shopping at E-Mart, which is like the target here. Um, or if I, you know, if I need to go to the library, if I need to go to the bank, uh, really, if I need to go to work, any, pretty much any place that I would want or need to go, I can take Nubija. And the beauty of it is, is when I, when taking Nubija, it's, it's a, you ride a very short distance, so uh, Changwon, much like many uh, Asian cities, is rather compact, so you don't ever have to go very far. The longest I would ever ride to any place, I think, would be, I don't know, uh, five kilometers. But even then, I, I probably wouldn't need to ride that much. Um, and But the beauty of it is you check it out, you find a bike that you like, and then when you're finished, you just dock it in and walk away, and then you're done. Uh, you know, with, with, other, with your own personal bike, uh, you can, you know, you have to worry, you know, oh, do I have to lock it up right? Will there be damage? Uh, will there be damages to it? Uh, I mean, theft isn't a big thing here, but that's, you know, it, it does happen. Um, and it also it allows for a very freeing lifestyle. So if I wanted to, uh, this is something that I'm going to miss a lot about Changwon is I like to do a lot of hiking. So 
I'll, I'll take up in the mornings what I would do before work at two o'clock in the afternoon. I'd ride a bike to the, the trailhead at the top of the, at the base of the mountain, park the Nubija, hike to the top, hike along the ridge, uh, and go down a different way and have another Nubija there waiting for me and just ride home and then go to work. That's a good day. Uh, or other things like, you know, uh, just, Kind of uh, the the easiness and, and multimodalism uh, with Nubija, you have you there, there's a there's a bus card and uh, bus payment system that can be attached to it. So I wanted to go to an NC Dinos, that's the Changwon baseball team. I wanted to go to an NC Dinos game in Masan, so I use my bus card slash Nubija pass, uh, get off in Masan, and then at the Masan station, then take a Nubija bike to the baseball stadium. Just just super easy, super convenient. It is. There's lots of ways in which it's a more convenient system than some of the higher profile systems that I've used. Like London's I liked for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I didn't like that, you know, there's not that many stations outside of central London and you only get half an hour each time you take one out or else they charge you two more pounds. So I'm always thinking, where's the next station? If you don't know exactly where it is, you're going to have a problem. But then again, I could use it there. You know, I'm a foreigner in England, of course, and I just put my credit card in and can take it out. Unlike here, it's... But even with all that, it's still... The Nubija is, is more convenient than, say... There are certain scattered systems in Seoul, like there's one bike share station by the World Cup Stadium, and I was there at that one. I can read Korean... My girlfriend's a native Korean speaker, and even we couldn't figure out the instructions, and we couldn't have got it anyway because of that not having a Korean cell phone thing. Why do they, why do, they do that in Korea? Why do, they, why do you need a Korean cell phone for so many things? Um, I think it's, it's implied that, well, of course you have a cell phone, and uh, of, like, of course you can, you can speak uh, Korean. I, I, you know, it, it also depends a lot on the populations you're serving. Because when I was in Daejeon, they have the public bike share system called Tashu and Tashu uh, is the local dialect is let's let's ride and uh, I was looking at a there's a, a research study done comparing Nubija, Changwon's Nubija and Daejeon's Tashu and Changwon's Nubija as mentioned before is, is a form of sustainable public transportation, this is public transportation how people get to one place from another um, while riding a bike and, and no, with no CO2 emissions or anything like that um, but with Daejeon's uh, Tashu system, this was a system, although popular, mostly used for recreation. Um, but the, the population in Daejeon is a much more, it's more of an international city in that you have uh, Kaist. Kaist, K-I-S-T, is, I forget, I, I could try to guess what it stands for, but basically it's Korea's MIT. So you have students from all over the world. MIT is probably technology. Let's, let's, make, let's make a health The K is probably Korea. Yeah, and then, then fill in the blanks. Institute? <laughs> the, S is, the S is really the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you have people from Europe and from the States and from Canada and all over the place who come to KAIST because of uh, its reputation and its, uh, and its uh, uh, prestige and, and technology and so uh, Tashu I found all their menus and it, their usability was all in English now Changwon at this point um, it's not quite there yet as as much as Changwon wants to be an international city and they're and they're working on it and uh, they're, they're they're trying and they're putting their efforts uh, in in this way uh, there there are some steps that could be there are there's some room for progress I'm uh, room for improvement um, there, I, I, we, we've had conversations before in Korea. There, there tends to be, uh, it can not always be as uh, easy to navigate for foreigners in some ways. Uh, like in the bigger cities like Busan and, and Seoul, you know, subway maps and everything. There's a lot of uh, English usability, but there are, are some things that are lacking. And one of which is if you don't have a Korean cell phone, it can be it can be difficult, and uh, kind of the blind assumption is like, well, of course you have a Korean cell phone. So, um, if Korea wants to really have the gains, it, it if Korea wants to achieve the gains in tourism that it wants, these are some things that you know are in the room for improvement category. Right. I get the sense, and maybe it's a sense you've got from conversations you've had with officials here as well, that. Changwon doesn't quite realize that it has, say, in its bike share system in Nubija, 
a system that would be the envy of a lot of cities around the world. Like they, they know they like it, but they don't. Maybe they don't understand that it's also something the world is really interested in. Uh, well, you know what? So Changwon is there's an organization called Ikle, and Changwon is a chair city of Ikle of Ikle's uh, sustainable cities. So Changwon is is a, a a, a chair city, meaning it contributes a lot of funds, and the reason that it does this too is for this worldwide recognition. So you have other cities, uh, I think Boulder, I think Portland, um, I want to say Bogota. So you have many, you have many many cities that are part of Ikle in this kind of sustainable cities community. And the reason that Changwon has done this is to say, you know, we want to be recognized in the on the world community, in the world stage, and so. They do make an effort to go to these conferences, and they're putting they're putting their finances there for this uh, recognition. But on, I feel like there are some other ways that, uh, again, in the room for improvement category, that uh, Changwon could be better known, uh, especially when when sharing uh, Nubija uh, can be better known for in the international community. Uh, again, this is things like uh, having a higher web presence, which I'm working on uh, with the city. But uh, there's there's some bureaucracy and red tape that exists in any government uh, any government structure. Now, when how long after you started using Nubija? How long after you got to Changwon? Were you did you get the sense you could contribute that you might want to start volunteering? You, you mentioned outreach earlier. This is something I hadn't mentioned in that part. Of, uh, so I started. What was called Changwon Bike Party, and what is called Changwon Bike Party, and Bike Party uh, is a group ride. It's similar to the Critical Mass, but has a different uh, a different goal, I suppose. Critical Mass is very political, and you know, this is you know, we're going to disrupt traffic, and this is why. That's how we do things in America. <laughs> but uh, Bike Party, uh, which which stemmed its root from the Bay Area's San Jose Bike Party. Uh, which I, I participated in, uh, in while well, living in the Bay Area. San Jose Bike Party was the pioneer of bike parties, but you have San Jose Bike Party, East Bay Bike Party, San Francisco Bike Party. So I've been well versed as a rider in bike party. But then after coming to Changwon, uh, you know, in July, I saw this system. I said, "Isn't this great? We should have a bike. We should. There should be Changwon Bike Party." So I'll use the verb I Tyler Durdened. <laughs> I Tyler Durdened uh, uh, a bike party here. So I, sorry, I kind of started, said, like, well, I've never organized this, but I feel like I know what it takes and what, what we can do to make it popular. And so uh, I came here in July, and the first Changwon bike party was held in September. Oh, wow. And so, so two months you were doing it. Yes, yeah. So I, I made a website and got the information out as best I could. Uh, I had seen the success and the real community that cycling had brought uh, while participating in these other bike parties. Um, Namely, because uh, it, it's it's so multifaceted when you, when you are participating in a bike party. What it is is you're building community amongst you know individuals, individual to individual. You're building uh, community with the individual to the actual physical city. In that, uh, I know from my personal experience while riding in San Jose, I went places that I did, never knew about, and then you kind of. And you get to know your community, and it, what it does is it builds more uh, a, a greater sense of community and more empathy. Um, especially, I feel like in, in America we have certain. If you look at a map, there's certain parts that people say, "Oh, don't go there; it's dangerous," or like, "Oh, don't go there; you'll get shot." I'm using air quotes. Um, but uh, what, what I liked about play, bike party is when you go into those communities as, as a large mass of people, and you just ride the roads. Um, it's you. You get to see these communities, and you get to see these communities for what they are. And it's it, oftentimes it's families, immigrant families. You have people coming up the lawn, waving, seeing what, what's going on. And what you're doing is you're kind of you're participating in a in a conversation in your community, and it and it creates equity because it changes your opinion opinion of places. And lastly, it changes uh, your uh, bike party changes the. Uh, a relationship of the the individual to his or her cycling capabilities. I never thought that I could bike 20 or 25 miles uh, ever 
Uh, but after doing Bike Party, you know, it's like it was three hours on a Friday night. By the time I finished, I was like, wow, I, I just biked 25 miles. This is the first time I'd ever done that. And so with Changwon Bike Party, we, we, we've gone through a, diff- a few different forms. Now we used to do only at night. The first one was six riders. Uh, now we have over 60 uh, uh, every month. Uh, it's a daytime ride. Uh, and so it, it again it changes people's perception of the place here it's we have a cross-cultural thing too because we have Korean participants uh, foreigner participants uh, everyone getting together and experiencing the the city getting to know one another and have better relationships with one, with one another which is again excellent way cross-culturally too for uh, Koreans and foreigners to engage with each other in a way that there's not the pressures of like, oh, you know, la- you don't even need the language barriers. You don't even need to necessarily speak the same language to enjoy. And um, and also, again, you have riders who say like, oh, I've never done commuter cycling like this before and uh, as a way to get to know their city and surroundings better and become more confident as a cyclist. Now, where have you gone in the Changwon bike parties you've had? I mean, what what parts of uh, the area have they taken you to that you might not have got to otherwise? As leader, I've, I've organized it, so that's always something I'm trying to show people some new and interesting places. Uh, and even though, like you mentioned, Changwon doesn't have that much of a history, uh, a place I like to go is it's called uh, Changwon Uijit, which is the house of Changwon, which was owned by some landowner around, I don't know, the year 1900. But it's kind of a traditional, uh, traditional I guess, a landowner's home and you have like a nice park so many people who don't know much about Changwon or even haven't experienced much the Korean architecture or, or history uh, can go here and it's a great place to take pictures um, we've, we've ridden from uh, Changwon to Jinhae uh, Changwon and Jinhae is separated by a mountain but there's a tunnel that goes through the mountain that has a bike lane so we've gone from uh, Changwon to Jinhae and out to the the bay there uh, in Jinhae, I guess it's the sea. Um, and so many people had never experienced going through uh, going through a tunnel and doing that kind of cycling. Uh, we've ended in in Masan at, at an NC Dinos game. I don't know we, I've, we've gone on over twenty, so it's kind of hard to to recollect all the things that we've done. They all blur into one. Yeah, yeah. One long, one very long one bike long party. Bike party. Yeah, but um, it's. It's really uh, gained popularity in a way that that I never imagined, uh, and, and I always hoped I, I'd hoped that by the time that I'd finished, that it would be able to continue without my being here. And now that I'm leaving, there is a team of, of volunteers that will be continuing it on without without me. And that's I mean that was that was my goal uh, in doing this. Um, it's it's brought people together. I've had people tell me like, you know, people said to me, "Oh, I was new in Changwon. I didn't really know many people." And this was such a great venue to, to make actual real relationships. As a foreigner here, it can be difficult to to find those pockets of community in which you you do get to see see each other and engage with each other in such a um, is it in such a meaningful way. A lot of times, people the the only social outlet is kind of nightlife activity uh, here, and so oftentimes people will see each other in the night in the nighttime bars or whatever, and that's how. That's the community that's formed, but unfortunately, those relationships don't often amount to strong relationships. But Bike Party has been able to be kind of a platform for uh, strong friendships and relationships to form. Doing the work that I do with Nubija, it's it gets people riding more. People tell me I ride Nubija more, which, as part of doing Nubija outreach and organizing Bike Party. That's the name of the game, is getting people riding more, getting people using the system more. So did you just turn up one day at the Nubija headquarters and say, can I, can I volunteer here? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, there's, a, there's a Changwon City Facebook group. I had a friend who, she runs the independent site Chang Wonderful, which is kind of a go-to for foreigners, things like, where is hiking? Where can I do my banking? Just things that... They'd been living here for, you know, three, four years, and so they kind of compiled all this information in a website. And uh, she had a contact at Changwon City Hall. Uh, he, he speaks English. He runs the Changwon City Hall Facebook page. And so I said, hey, I really like this Nubija system you have. Uh, I think that I'd like to get some professional experience and move into public cycle share professionally. Um, how can you help me? And so I organized... They kind of went through a little screening process. They're like, all right, 
show us what you got. And so I kind of showed them the work that I had been doing already previously with Bike Party. Uh, I kind of put together a little podcast episode of saying, you know, interviewing some foreigners and a Korean person. What is Nubi Joe? Why do you like to ride it? Uh, this kind of thing. And I think also another kind of written proposal. And then uh, after a little scrutiny, they said, okay. Uh, and then I was working on the delivery truck. So kind of as a... Uh, so there was a driver, but I would help load the trucks. And this was as a way to understand, all right, what is the Nubi just system? Why do, why do these bikes go here? Why are we doing this? Why do we go here? Uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of it. And then also I, I've worked in the repair shop too, which uh, I think we talked about this earlier was well, rather daunting because I, 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 as a site, you know, I'm embarrassed to say this. I, I'd been a cyclist for a long time, but I didn't know much about uh, maintenance and repair. And so this was kind of an opportunity for me to learn maintenance and repair. But here I am in uh, a public capacity in that, you know, these people, this is their job to get these bikes out. And so I didn't want to be much of a burden and that, like, uh, feeling like dead weight. So I have that pressure and then the pressure of uh, not knowing Korean very well. And so I'm learning something in which I'm not that comfortable with yet and in a language that I'm not very comfortable with. But I, I did have enough Korean to, to learn, but lengthily, uh, my repair my repair instructor was just extremely patient with me, and we, we still continue to ha uh, have a good relationship. And In that kind of situation, you learn both of those things fast, the language and the repair, because you have to learn them fast. It really forces you to pick it all up quickly, right? Sink or swim. <laughs> yes, exactly. You have swum. And it's what have you? What have been some interesting things you you learned that you didn't realize at first about the system, the way it works? I mean, one fascinating thing for me was to see when we went up to the bike graveyard at the top of the maintenance facility with these hundreds and hundreds of messed up bikes that are getting parted out for other bikes, and it's like you see a bike kind of curved from being maybe kicked by a drunken high schooler. Who knows? I mean, what what's been what have been some surprising I don't know about revelations, but things you've learned from Nubija. Nubija is incredible. The system, I mean, again, it's been around since 2008, so we're going on six years now. It's the, I have met kind of the IT architect of it. Um, it's extremely smart. Uh, the IT has patterns and it learns from the patterns. So basically, it says, you know, it's this time of day, it's this sort of month. You know what is the? This is what the demand will be at this at these locations. This this we need this many bikes because it's going to be this. Uh, it's going to be the usage is going to be at this rate. So that's the kind of things as usually a newbie terminal they want about 50% occupied, 50% unoccupied, which means uh, if there's place you need you need uh, half of the stalls to be empty, half the the racks to be empty because people need to park the bikes. And you also need half the bikes to be there because people need to take out bikes. There need to be bikes for them to take out. But this with the system, it changes during commuter hours. So in places that are going to be popular, especially we talked about Changwon's many uh, factories, uh, the factories often have Nubija terminals because they encourage rider, they encourage their workers to ride Nubija into work. And so. Uh, as part of the morning uh, delivery and redistribution is you want to keep those very empty. You want to you want to keep those very, very empty So because people are going to be coming in and coming in and coming in. Uh, and also with residences, uh, they have very large apartment complexes here in, in Korea. You have buildings that are, you know, 15, 16, 20, you know, we were talking 40. I don't think it's the limit. Yeah, I don't think there's any 40 in, in Changwon, but... Um, but you have, you know, these very tall uh, apartment buildings. Obviously, a very high density population, and so with these uh, Nubija terminals for these very high density populations, you want to keep those full, like beyond, uh, you know, beyond 50%. Obviously, because people are going to be taking them. And then there's those little nuances that you learn about, like there's an apartment complex that we would go to. Uh, that was kind of on its uphill, and we'd always front load it. And this was even off of commuter hours. So off of commuter hours, you usually want 50%. But we would always front load it, and so there'd be instead of 50% capacity, you'd have it like 80% capacity. I'm like, well, and I, in Korean, as best I can, ask, 
I was saying, you know, wh why are we, why are we loading? You know, this is more than 50%. Why are we loading it? And he said to me, well, we're uphill. Yeah. So people are going to take them downhill and they're not going to get that even evening out of, uh, of the system naturally working itself out. Because a lot of times that's how it works out is popular places, especially during non-commuter hours, about as many people are taking in as they are taking out. But with a place that's uphill, you don't have that. Other nuanced thing I learned from the architecture, the sort of architect uh, IT uh, writer, uh, he told me about the reg. There's a, a system, uh, there's something that's written that uh, if a bike is taken out three times, with each time being under 30 seconds, so a bike is taken out and then put back in within 30 seconds. If this happens three times, the bike is automatically flagged for a uh, possible uh, damage of some kind. Maybe it's a flat tire. Maybe there's something wrong uh, with with the bike. Um, and that being the beha human behavior of they take out the bike. Oh, uh, you know, it has this problem. It has this problem. I'm just going to dock it back in and take out another bike. So it's not... You know, that's not 100% of the time, but it's a high likelihood that that bike has something wrong with it. And there's something written in in the code that, you know, we, we have this, we, they've thought about it. So I, I'm hoping, I, 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 would love, I would love for them to think, okay, it's raining on a Monday. This is, this is our system's needs. Yes, right. like, they can always get a little bit more information incorporated in. They can always make it smarter. No, I, I think of... Well, we both grew up around Seattle, Washington in the 90s and 2000s, and Seattle itself has this reputation for being progressive, technological, forward-thinking in, in a lot of ways, and it even has a reputation as a big cycling city. I wonder, do you think, do you think the reputation is deserved at the moment in its current state of development? I, I go back and forth on that. Yeah, you mean Seattle? And Seattle. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, th I think now Seattle's doing a great job in terms of poising itself uh, for being a 21st century, a 21st century city. Um, in the past, it hasn't sort of made those gains that it's wanted to. Like, you know, I think probably since we were kids, you know, we were talking, you know, there's always been this like, when is when is public transportation going to come? And it's always something that local governments had dragged their feet on. But now they have one train line only. Right, right. But I mean, there. I just talked to my friend in Seattle via Skype the other day, and uh, they they're really like from Capitol Hill to uh, the U District. There's I don't know which hill they've gone through. They've just really just dug through, and they've done maybe dug like 200 feet down. Yeah. So they're really kind of I guess making up for lost time. There's a, a Pronto bike share system run by Alta that's coming through and sponsored by Alaska Airlines that's coming through in fall of this year. Um, the the Sounder, the Airport Express, again, it, it took a while, but it's just kind of getting there. Uh, Seattle's uh, progressively leading the charge uh, for all sorts of uh, social... Uh, Seattle and, and Washington State are lead, leading the charge for all sorts of uh, social progressivism. Uh, things like, you know, gay marriage got recently approved by the, the, sta by the state last year, uh, pushing for a... Uh, the SeaTac pushed for the $15 an hour minimum wage, and I think Seattle is also... The Seattle City Council is going to be going for the $15 city minimum wage. Um, the Seattle Public Library, you can check out books from the library on your Kindle. Yeah. So there's... There's a lot of, I feel like there's there's a lot of ways that cities can develop, uh, but I feel like a lot of the steps that Seattle and the Puget Sound region are taking are in the direction that I feel will be essential to its growth and its livability for the 21st century. Yeah, you, you can look at Seattle now. It's I can be pretty optimistic about the place more so than I was before. I feel like during our childhoods, they just kind of pointed to Space Needle and Starbucks and were like, look, we're, we're rolling. But now, yeah, it's, it's like Los Angeles where I live. The acceleration in the building of transit infrastructure and bike culture has been shocking to some people. But uh, it might be a, just the American West Coast. I mean, tell me, you, you're going back to America soon. What, what do you want to bring back to America in terms of what you've learned from Korea, from Changwon, from Nubija? Well, I'd say my... When, when I think about what I'll miss most about uh, Korea is uh, they, there's, there's a payment system here called T-Money. Oh, T-Money. I love T-Money. T-Money. Let me get out my T-Money card here. 
So what T-Money is, is in the U.S., I think in Seattle it's called the Orca card. Which you have to pay $5 for, just the card. Oh, really? I, I think T-Money it was like 3 Maybe to buy the car. Still high-ish, but five. Yeah, My God. Yeah. Or in the bay, and the Bay Area is kind of getting better about this with Clipper. Um, but what it is is it's a way that you can put money on this and use this for any transit system. Now, now for Clipper in the Bay Area, Bay Area has lots of different kinds of transit. You have Caltrain, you have BART, you have uh, many different buses. You have Metro. You have many different bus systems within the the suburbs and cities of. Oakland, uh, San Francisco, San Jose, and on the peninsula. And, and Clipper is good for all of those. T-Money does do one better. It's for the entire country. So you can be on a subway. You can be on a bus system. You can be on the airport express to, to Incheon Airport and Seoul. In a taxi, you can use it. In a taxi. Which is, I mean, Americans, listen again. In a taxi, you can use your subway card, which works in Busan, in Seoul, wherever else. The entire country. This is a country of 55 million people. And if you have T-Money, you can be anywhere in the country and use this for, again, you can use this for, uh, taxi, buses, uh, uh, subway systems for the entire country. It's it's incredibly amazing. You can even use it, in the, uh, and depending on like what kind of store you're in, too, you can use it to buy like a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, so it's it's incredible. And you just go to many any of the many convenience stores here and just say, you pay in cash, like oh, I want five dollars on my T Money card, and then and then you're good to go. What I've told, what I've been told is in the states that there's so many uh, contracts and competing contracts that that's probably that that would stifle the progress of a system like this. There's always there's always that element, and there's other things that seem like endemic to America as well. For example, in that bike graveyard at the top of the maintenance facility, we were joking with the mechanic there about how. And he was saying what a shame it was that high schoolers would get drunk and kick the bikes. We were saying, yeah, in, in America it'd be even worse. Like, it's our instinct to think that stuff just gets screwed up more in America by people. You know, it's the first thing. In Japan, it was always about the vending machines. Like, there's so many vending machines here, even more than here, with good stuff in them. Everywhere, even even alcohol. And it's like, yeah, and whenever I got together with another American, it'd be like, yeah, those things, if those were in New York or Los Angeles, like, we just assumed they would get demolished by people what why do we assume people will be so irresponsible well you know another thing to mention too is i, I think they have these in japan too are the uh in a park uh the public workout facilities like there's this there's kind of like a self-propelled elliptical machine or like a little like kind of shoulder press kind of not, none of it have weights inversion table yeah yeah it's it's for old people to not not necessarily old people but old people and middle-aged people to use them to kind of keep their body in good condition and they do use them too you see them they use them and they, they remain in good condition um in so there there is this idea that and you could agree with it or disagree with it but it's worth mentioning i guess it's worth talking about it uh in mia book in mia burke's book mia burke is uh the president and founder of alta bike share and uh former guest on the show from a couple of years ago when i was in portland Wow, you got Mia Burke. Uh, yeah, so Mia Burke in her in her book uh, Free Ride, uh, she mentions this theory like if you shine a light, like the cockroaches scatter. And so uh, in her work with uh, Alta, they don't only do bike share, but they do also bike trail planning. That like people will say like, oh, you know, if we have a bike trail, that means all the criminals will come and and you know. It's about criminals in America, so. <laughs> Um, you know, if, if you have a bike share, it'll be like vagrants and, and vagabonds. Uh, <laughs> insane. Whomever. Yeah, this, yeah, mass yeah. Of, this mass of crazies and, yes. and uh, you know, they'll be the ones using these bike routes, bike trails for whatever. Um, but I think, you know, uh, she was talking, it's like, you know, make them nice. You know, if you make it nice and you allow people to... Uh, kind of take ownership and you know make it something that people are proud of it also kind of goes back to um, in New York City while uh, Rudy Giuliani was um, what was new was the new mayor of New York City there was what was called the, the broken window the broke broken window policy broken window theory broken, broken window, window theory yeah where like how a broken window can affect the entire neighborhood because uh, when people see a, if a broken window is quickly repaired, 
then it's uh, it's seen as like, okay, this is a place worth taking care of. But what happens is when there's one broken window, it can later turn into two broken windows, then a broken door, and then it's really, and then it's an epidemic. Mal- Malcolm Gladwell talks about this. Uh, it takes it people, because it the context has changed, the, this is a building no longer worth caring for, and then the building no longer worth caring for becomes a street no longer worth taking care of, and then you have the neighborhood no longer worth taking care of, and so it's the little things. Actually, the country no longer worth yeah. taking care of. <laughs> right. So it's the little things that uh, if you can if you can address them and uh, you know make make them worth taking care of. And sending a message, like uh, also Malcolm Gladwell talked about, this was in Tipping Point, uh, the reason that they were able to clean up the subways and make them, because they were really dangerous, I think, in the 80s, 70s, 80s. You see those movies, like, and the, they didn't do that for the movie. The whole interior of the subway car is just graffiti. Yeah, yeah, and so what they did was, this is so, this is what Malcolm Gladwell talked about in Tipping Point, is what they did was... Uh, to make the subway riding experience better for New Yorkers and for for tourists was because there was graffiti. This kind of goes back to the the broken window theory that all right, this isn't worth taking care of. And so uh, what they did was, you know, these train these subway cars would be waiting there, and some of these graffiti artists would be two, three days, spent all this time. Oh, someone's gonna, everyone's gonna see this. They're gonna know how great I am. They waited until it was all finished, and then they just. Boom! Wiped it away, washed it away, and just send the message that you're going to work hard on this, and no one is going to see it. And so, and so that was part of the way that they tried to clean up the image of the subway. This is something worth caring about. Also, fare beating, people hopping, hopping the turnstiles, was a problem. Uh, they cracked down. You know, there was violent crime going on in the subway. Why, why crack down on fare beating? But again, it changes the culture. This is something that. You know, we will crack down on this. This is something worth valuing. In Korea, though, it doesn't seem like people are less vandalistic because the country is run by hard asses. You know what I mean? Like, maybe it is. I don't know. But is that is it because they're so strict here, or is it is it more than that? I mean, it, it's cultural. I think also in uh, in Japan, it's it's also there is something inherent that we should respect. Uh, public place or we should respect other people uh this is not 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 always the case but um uh this is this is something that's a little more inherent in the cultural experience here than rather in the united states for example i can't tell you how many times i've been shushed on public transportation because my loud voice has been causing a disturbance to the other people and this kind of took took some adjusting for me and especially when talking with Korean people I'm like why did that guy shush me it's like well you know we should be quiet because we 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 could be disrupting others and this idea that we should be blah 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 because we could be blah 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 that doesn't really exist as much in America there's that we have in Korea there's what's it's based on Confucianism in which there's a hierarchy basically uh, old, old we should listen to older people we should listen to people older than us, even if it <laughs> isn't the isn't the best way, or if it isn't the way that makes the most sense or is the most convenient. Um, there's because of, there's this hierarchy that like we need to, um, you know, they are our seniors and we should listen to them. And that's that's that a lot of. So I think with public property and uh, and being uh, conscientious of people, a lot of it kind of stems from that. This is something that Malcolm Gladwell also wrote about, isn't it? The, how the sort of other side of that, where a while ago you would also get co-pilots who didn't want to tell the more senior pilot the plane was about to go down. So I guess there's a new balance to strike in the 21st century, now. Yes, yes. Um, you know, is there, especially going back, it's 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 interesting when talking with the uh, with the city officials about. You know, I mentioned like, oh, you know, uh, why don't we do this or why don't we do that. There's always a certain approach you have to take, and that shows the respect of age. And there's a way to do it. Oh yes, um, and I'm I'm learning that, and hopefully I can get better at it. But uh, I was talking with a colleague in the city hall, and I said, "Oh, I want to do this. Um, you know, can you talk to your boss?" I'm like, "Well, what, what can we do to make this happen?" He's like, and it was I. I he said to me, "He's like, well." I'm going to propose this, and I'm older than him, and so even though like, <laughs> that's something, that's a phrase you would never hear yeah. in the United States. You maybe would say, I'm 
higher on the org chart than this guy or like, yeah, I pay the guy's salary, but you wouldn't say, I was born before him, therefore, we're going to do it this way. Yeah, yeah, so uh, so it's like, I'm older than him, so I think maybe I can tell him that we're going to do this way. And it also becomes a problem when uh, when hiring in companies, there's an age limit, you know, if someone is going to be... Uh, going into an entry level position, it's you have to get in at a certain age because if you uh, if you get in and you're too old for this entry level position, uh, you could have a, a boss who's younger than you, and that will not be good for the office. And yeah, so it's that mismatch, like what, we don't know what to do because there's the seniority, but then there's the seniority. And so the best way to do it is just say like, well, you know, you're too old for this entry level position. Right. Yeah, in America we don't think about relative age i mean a boss that's younger than you is not uncommon and you know what what are some of the things you think are going to reverse culture shock you have you been sufficiently koreanized to the processes here that you'll be you'll have to you'll have to rethink things when you get back to the states uh i guess that's we'll have to see um i i could see that i i could see the, the ageism thing has kind of been ingrained in me at this point where I would think like, oh, you know, you should be kinder to me because I'm older. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> hopefully it's not that stark. Hopefully I won't have too many gains to be uh, acclimatized to go back to the States. Um, I think actually just the, the convenience of, of travel and the convenience of, of getting around. Like I mentioned, you know, this is a really compact city and everything is, the distances are, are very close. And if I want to go to another city, you can just hop on an inner city bus at a very low price. Lots of freedom, lots of lots of mobility, and I think uh, I'm going to try to not. I'm going to try to abstain from owning a car as best I can in the United States. It's possible. It's possible. I, it, depending on where you are, especially like if you're already in an urban setting, uh, it's it's certainly doable. Um, but I, I hope it doesn't cause. I, I hope I can have the freedom and happiness that I have here uh, without an automobile. Yes, it works a lot better in the center of Seattle, say, than even the closest suburbs. Like, it's, you go a little distance, and the convenience drops so far off in American cities. Has that been your experience? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, It's getting better. It's getting better. Like, uh, when uh, I was visiting, before I came to Korea, I was staying with my parents in Shoreline, which is about 20 miles north of Seattle. Uh, Luckily, with the Sounder, the public transportation that Seattle has, it's really skeletal right now but the sounder goes has a station stop in Edmonds uh, so I was able it only runs during commuter hours but uh, I was able to in the morning ride from shoreline through Woodway to the Edmonds station put my bike on the sounder uh, bike rack and then go into Seattle station and then later just for, for fun I was going to Portland so I was able to get from my doorstep in in shoreline to Portland without ever needing an automobile nice which it's one of those things you don't expect in america but it's sometimes it is possible and getting more possible all the time by the way listeners in, in edmonds very good korean restaurant hosting uh which where which is where i got my intro to korean food but i've got much more education here in korea itself about the uh, the eating to be done in, in korean cuisine but that's neither here nor there because it's 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 interesting in america the way things are developing, you mentioned taking your bike onto a train. Like, I do that kind of thing a lot. We have to combine methods. There's no, there's no one way that works really well. But if you if you figure out the sort of combination combinations and permutations of transportation, it, you can make you can make things work right now in the states. Seriously. Well, it 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 depends on the population. Uh, Gil Penalosa, who, who's done a TED talk on, he runs the organization called Eight to Eighty Cities. And that's uh, this idea that cities should be livable spaces for people ages 8 to 80. And oftentimes, if you're kind of a young, able-bodied, and oftentimes, depending on the city, male, uh, your options are a lot different than uh, if otherwise. And so for young, healthy men like us, uh, absolutely, like, multimodalism, combining cycling and public transportation is, is absolutely, like, the way to go and the easy, convenient way to go. But depending on where you go, even simple things like things that for, that I would take for granted of, okay, I'm going to go down in the subway. I'm just going to put my bike over my shoulder and walk down the stairs. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But with other other people, depending on like if you have 
a six-year-old woman who needs to take her bike over her shoulder and walk down the stairs, uh, it's not always as convenient. So we, we do have some we do, we do have some strides to make. What you know, those eight to eighty cities. Um, but I, I mean, Seattle in the West Coast and also places on the East Coast and in the middle, it's, it's starting to catch along. But um, it's main the, the charge is being led by cities and city governments, um, and you know. You know, as I explained, taking the sounder from Edmonds, uh, you know, there's not always these kinds of options. I have a friend in Georgia. Uh, I have a friend from Georgia who, who I live with here, who lives here in Changwon. He was saying, like, there's just no way, no way to do anything without without owning a car. Or if you're out in the suburbs in Dallas or something, you know, they're, they're working on it. But uh, it, it, it doesn't have the same connectivity here. I mean, what I love... Here is I've done a lot of uh, cycling out in the countryside, and you'll see bus stops just on country roads. I, I mean, maybe they have that in the states. I'm not, but not nearly as common, I'd imagine. Yeah, and you're waiting a long time for those buses in the states. You know, the frequency goes down so far when you leave the core of a city. Right, but there are some improvement. I mean, there are some things that the United States does have over. We can talk about them. We can celebrate them. Yes. That does have over transportation-wise. Like for example, uh, here. Uh, on our city buses, we don't have we don't have bike racks on city buses. None at all. None, none at all. Uh, and that's actually pretty true of a lot of countries and areas outside of the United States. Um, and so, like, if I wanted, I have a fold-up bike, uh, so I can fold it up and put it on the interior, put it in the interior of a bike with me. I treat it like luggage. But if I had just a regular full-size bike, I couldn't take it on a bike on a bus with me in uh, in Changwon. Uh, so. Uh, and I think I heard something in the U.S. I think 70% of bike uh, bus systems in the U.S. have uh, that fold-down bike rack. We expect them, and in fact, I take them enough for granted that I always want there to be more of them. Like these, they have these long buses in Los Angeles, the articulated ones that go down like Wilshire Boulevard or wherever, and there could be 150 people on the bus. Still, there's two bike spots, so you have to wait for like I waited for six to pass, and maybe got. Was space, you know, so that can be difficult. But they're there. Yeah, yeah. I I used to uh, when I lived in uh, I used to live in San Jose, and I worked in Morgan Hill, which is a good twenty five miles south of San Jose, and is much more uh, kind of agricultural. My commute was I would ride my bike to downtown San Jose take the light rail to some southern part of San Jose from the light rail station, take my bike with, on the bus uh, and then take the bus down to Morgan Hill and then ride. Uh, and so I sometimes I'd be down in Morgan Hill with my bike and the bus would already have two bikes on it, but I thankfully have had a hand, I've had like patient bus drivers to say, okay, just wheel it on in the back. And so I've been grateful for that. But um, I have a folding bike now and uh, uh, it's it's the way to go. I'm I'm gonna bring it with me. I bought it here in Korea, and I'm gonna bring it with me when I go back to the United States, just in terms of providing the freedom uh, that I that I want. Uh, I'm very happy with it. Very satisfied. Now I haven't rode a folding bike here myself yet, but I've tried a variety. I've tried, as I say, the, the as you know, the Nubija bikes here in Changwon. I've tried. They have there's free mountain bikes you can use by the Jamshil station in Seoul. Tried those. Uh, tried a sort of shoddy rental bike along the uh, Hangang bike path, one of these barely maintained things. Uh, it was still fun. I've tried electric bikes that go quite fast in, in Busan. I've tried to get as much of an image of the overall cycle culture here in Korea as I, as I can, but what has been your take on it? How, how cyclable a country is this right now? Um, Korea is a great cycling country. Um, in most cities, I mean, Changwon, Changwon gets an A+, plus, uh, because of its uh, separated bike lanes. You have the concrete barrier, again, which really uh, increases the number of riders because of their feelings of safety. They're not kind of neck and neck with cars. Um, but cycling is, is popular, and it's uh, growing more and more popular. Uh, on the sidewalks, most sidewalks you'll see kind of a green section and, an or and a red section, kind of a brick-colored and the brick colored, often there's like a, a bicycle emblem on there. It's like, all right, the sidewalk is for biking, which we don't do as much in the United States because there are bike lanes. But the fact that they're acknowledging uh, its presence is is a good thing. Um, I 
I have also in my time here, there's a cycling program called the Four Rivers Trail. And the Four Rivers, which would be the Han, the Han River, as mentioned. Uh, the Han River, the Nakdong River, which runs from Busan to Andong, the Yongsan River, and the Gum River. Uh, this, these are called the Four Rivers. And they have, along these four rivers, is kind of an ec- ecological project. They have dams along the way, and they have, at these dams, they have sort of these red, uh, old English style phone booths. Inside, they have a stamp. Uh, like a stamp pad so you buy your little stamp booklet and then you get your stamps along the way and after you complete the entire uh, Four Rivers tour which in totality is about 800 something kilometers uh, you get you, you get a little medal uh, as a, your accomplishment yeah it's, it's something you've it's something you've got recently so it's it's probably the best souvenir of Korea you can have as a, as a cyclist here right yeah so the program actually there's two there's two medals you can get there's what's called the cross country ride which goes from Busan at the southern tip of the country up to Seoul up to the, the, the northern part of the country as far as you can go essentially in Korea. yeah yeah and that and that filters out to Incheon and that ride is I think 700 Three, I want to guess uh, kilometers. So that's the cross country medal, and then there's the the Four Rivers medal, uh, which I had mentioned the the Four Rivers that which I had previously mentioned. And so I had received my Four Rivers medal uh, first, and then just recently I got my cross country medal by that, which was actually once you have the Four Rivers, you get the cross country one. It's not not as hard because there's just a hundred kilometer bike path that connects the the Han River, which is the northern one, and the Nakdong River, which is the southern one. There's just kind of a hundred kilometer bridge in between this uh, cycle path. And once I completed that, I was eligible to get my cross country medal. So I have my, my two medals and my stamp passport, and hopefully a lot of knowledge and resources I can share when I go back to the United States. When you get back finally, what's the, what's the ride in the States you're most looking forward to doing? Oh, geez, I haven't thought about that. Um, I, I, we had talked earlier. Uh, I haven't done much. I, so, I mean, I, growing up in Seattle, I've been to Canada and uh, British Columbia and Vancouver uh, several times, I think five or six. But uh, I haven't been there since in about 10 years. So I'd like to go to, to Canada and see Canada by bike. Like uh, I'd mentioned earlier, taking the bike to Portland. Uh, that was just fun to be in uh, a new city and cycling around, seeing the city by cycle. So I don't see why uh, I, I should continue continue doing what I love and go to Vancouver and see the city by bike. Your first your first big American ride could be Canadian. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I like it. Another stamp on my passport. Too. <laughs> I've been speaking here in Changwon with Kobe Zeifman. He's the organizer of Changwon Bike Party. He's been working with the Nubija Bike Share System here, and he's about to cap off how many years here? Two years. Two years, around two years, and back home to the States. Kobe, thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to all the backers of Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea tour on Kickstarter. Adam Hartzell, Aidan Nullman, Alfred Lee, Andy Cooney, Angus Gordon, Bala Chenupati, Cam Smith, Chin Music Press, Dan Caraselli, Danny, Deborah Smith, Emmett Ferriger, Humberto Grant, Ian Plosker, Ismail Kennessy, Jackie Gast, Jay Chang, Jeffrey Davis, James DeVito, Jonathan Filbert, Josh Paget, Kimberly Hahn, Manvir, Mark Hines, Matthew, Matthew Workman, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Monica Eck, Michael Fransky, MJ Pritchett, Patrick O'Flaherty, Patrick Park, Piers Rippey, Robert Salzberg, Samuel Hansen, Sean Brown, Themistoclus Recrucis, Thomas Unterberger, Timothy Dobbs, and Wayne Wright.